Uh, we're going to get into scripture this morning. Uh, as you may notice, Pastor Scott is on holidays. He's gone for the next couple of weeks, so you're stuck with me and Riley. Riley Braun is, Pastor Riley Braun, let's just start that already, is, is going to be preaching uh, next week. For those of you that don't know him, Riley uh, has served at Grace for a long time. He's been a key part of our youth ministry. Uh, he's, he's preaching next week, and you're not going to want to miss it. He's, this guy's a ball of energy. Um, his passion inspires me to be a better follower of Jesus. This guy is one of the most passionate people you will know about Jesus. Like, good luck trying to find somebody more passionate about Jesus. This guy writes sermons for hobby time. Literally, he writes sermons in his pastime. He, he is so passionate about Jesus. He is going to be an amazing pastor. So be there next week. Um, it's probably going to be far better than this morning. So. And then I got to follow him up again after the, the week after that. And, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but for these few weeks, uh, we're going we're gonna to be ditching the hero series that, that Pastor Scott kind of concluded last week uh, with the hero being Jesus. And, and we're going to do a little mini series um, talking about some parables. And hopefully what we can do is, is we're going to attempt to retell a couple parables. We're going to attempt to, to apply some of these parables to uh, modern day context. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be interesting. And in order to do so, what I want to do this morning is I want to really, really dive deep into this first parable. And, and then we're going to see how it can apply to our lives. Um, the goal of this mini-series is to, is to leave you a little bit challenged, a little bit um, stirred up, and, and, and wonder how some of these, these parables might actually really apply um, directly to our current context. See, the beauty of a parable, the beauty of a parable is that they are literally just a story. They are just a story. They are an allegorical way of, of Jesus communicating. Uh, he takes these cultural relevancies of the day and strings them together in a way to illustrate maybe one or two points, maybe three. Um, it, Jesus does this and he tells a story. He makes up these, these situations. It's not um, written in fact. It's not like historical documents. Parables, we have to read them different because they are different. Um, the beauty of them is that, is that they can actually be interpreted in multiple ways. It's kind of crazy because Jesus isn't necessarily black and white in some of these parables. There's a lot of, there's a lot of room for interpretation. I would actually place, I, I would bet that if we were to sit down, if you and I were to sit down and read three consecutive parables and, and just sit there, read the parables, each on our own, not have any further study, not have anything else, we might come away with three different points for all of those parables. We might not. We might come away with similar things. But, but with parables, there's a lot of flexibility. It depends. What, if you focus on a different character in the parable or if you focus on, on the context or one word or one situation, there's a lot of room for flexibility in parables. And it's, that's, that's kind of the beauty of it. So this morning we're going to take a look at perhaps one of the most famous parables in all of Scripture. I think it's one of the most two popular or preached on parables, and that is the parable of the Good Samaritan. How many of you have heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan? I think even if you're not a Christian, you've probably heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's like, it's a really popular story. Uh, it's going to be really fun. It's going to get, I hope, hopefully we can dive um, deep into the context this morning. Uh, by the way, the other one that I think is the most popular. Does anybody guess? Any, throw out what you think the most popular parable is. Prodigal son. That was my guess too. Does anybody else think there's a rival? No, it's like <laughs> prodigal son and, and this parable and that's it. Like there's nothing even close. What's another popular one that pops into your mind? The seeds. Sowing seeds. Love it. Anything else? Yes, love it. What's your favorite parable? The coins? Love it. Maybe I'll preach on that in a couple weeks. I haven't locked that one down yet, so uh, we'll, we'll, figure, we'll figure that out when we get there. Uh, it's going to be good. It's a good series, so let's get at it. This is one of my favorite parables. This is one of my favorite teachings of Jesus. Um, we're starting, uh, we're turning to Luke chapter 10, if you, if you would, starting at verse 25. I'm going to actually turn there so that I don't just like, like I think I've got it pretty memorized, but I don't want to completely butcher it. I'm just kidding. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. 
But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and he saw the man, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side as well. But a Samaritan, but a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil, pouring oil on wine. Then he, he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think will be a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this parable. Thank you for this teaching uh, that we can gleam at. And, and we, can, we can look at this story um, that was recorded m almost 2,000 years ago, God, and we can apply it to our context, to our lives today. So I pray that you will, through this parable, show us who you are, God. Show us your heart. Show us your passion. Show us um, who we ought to be as we, as we follow you, Jesus, and, and just speak to us now. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. You with me? Sweet. Greg's with me. Nice. All right. Here we go. First of all, I want to talk just a little bit more about what the point of a parable is. You got to get, you got to get this. Understand that this, this story is not based on true events. Yes, this encounter that Jesus has with this religious leader is a true event. That is a true event. But this story that Jesus tells is the parable. Isn't a, it didn't happen necessarily. Something like this might have similarly happened. But this story, this parable, is not based necessarily on true events. Jesus likely spent a couple of years wandering the Galilean countryside, speaking in synagogues, speaking in village centers to thousands of people, most of them who did not follow him. The Good Samaritan, uh, most scholars think, was likely told many times in many different forms to many different people groups. And Jesus, being the genius of, of rhetoric and public speaking that he was, he would have adapted its context, its length, its style, depending on the crowd that he was speaking to. Parables aren't Jesus just reciting an event that happened, uh, you know, a couple days ago. He's using story, he's using allegory to illustrate a point. Don't be uncomfortable by this. Don't be, I'm not saying that the words in scripture didn't happen or that the words, uh, these, these aren't true. That's not what I'm saying. Jesus literally makes up these stories to, to, to illustrate a point. It's the way he communicated. Actually, it's the way that a lot of people communicated in the day. It's, a lot of communication took place through telling stories, not necessarily just historical, factual stories, but, but these parable-like stories. The other important thing to grasp, and this is really important to remember for the entirety of these three weeks that we're going to be talking about, is that when Jesus is telling a parable, he's almost always talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's almost always talking about the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus is in the process of revealing what this kingdom of heaven is like. And that's why when you read most of the parables, it, it literally starts with, most of them start with a phrase like, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. When Jesus is talking in this parable language, this storytelling language, he's almost always talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's almost always talking about what God's kingdom, what God's rules, what the, what the heavenly way of living is like. The kingdom of heaven is a complex idea. It's a complex thing to understand, to wrap our, to wrap our mind around our minds around, sorry, but essentially Jesus, when he came to earth, he was bringing the kingdom of heaven with him, and he fully brought the kingdom of heaven, but there's this weird dynamic in, the, in, in this language because the kingdom of heaven both fully came in Jesus and is yet to fully come. 
So, so when we talk about the kingdom of heaven over the next few weeks, we're talking about the way that God operates, the way that, that Jesus operates, this, the, the kingdom principles, and, and essentially how the, the kingdom of heaven came through Jesus and is yet to still fully come. It's both a now and a not yet. It's both here now and still to come in future days. And the coolest part about this, um, and this is a whole other sermon, but on the kingdom of heaven, is, is that we get to participate in this. That we as Christians actually get to participate in, in making earth a little bit more like heaven. I believe that that's actually one of our primary calls as Christians, is that we get to participate in bringing the kingdom of heaven down to earth and making the world around us a little bit more like heaven. We get to participate in this kingdom of heaven being unveiled. So those are two important things to remember as we're going through these parables. One, they're almost always about the kingdom of heaven. And two, Jesus isn't necessarily telling a factual historical story. He's using, he's using story, he's using allegory to, to illustrate a point. So as for this particular parable, what is the point? What do these details that Jesus includes from the story allow us to pull from it? How does it apply to the, the hearers of the, of the first century? How does it apply to the people that have heard it through the in, entirety of history up until now? How, how does it apply to us today? Well, there's a first, I'm, I'm just gonna highlight a few things that I think are super important to understand the context of this story. This story, I, I think, it's bigger than we see just on, on face value. We have, like anything in scripture, like my Bible college professors would constantly tell you, it's like, you gotta understand the context. We're, this was written to a group of people 2,000 years ago in a, in a completely different world. And when we, when we get a glimpse of what was actually going on in this story, it becomes that much bigger, all right? So the first thing that I wanna I want point out is that this is, this is a commentary that Jesus is is giving to the Jewish church, the Jewish, this Jewish leader in this particular instance, on this Old Testament principle of loving God and loving your neighbor. Obviously, we know that the religious leader was trying to catch Jesus. It says right in Scripture that he, he stood up to test Jesus. He was trying to catch him, and, and this was a very common thing that the, the religious leaders of the day did to Jesus. They were trying to trap Jesus by getting him to say something that, that was against the law so that they could justify punishing him. And eventually they, they thought they did, so they killed him. But, but you know how that story goes. That's another day. This religious leader was trying to catch Jesus saying something that he shouldn't be according to the law. But the question that is asked by this religious expert in the law was, was likely stemmed out of the fact, and you gotta understand this, this is important to the story, the fact that Jewish people had a different view on what it meant to be your neighbor. This word neighbor, they had a different kind of understanding than we might today, especially as, as New Testament Christians, especially as, as Christians in the 21st century. See, this, the word neighbor certainly to these Jews did not include everybody. That's important to understand. The, the word neighbor did not include everybody. And at the very least, Gentiles, not Jews, were definitely not included in this. So when Jesus is asked this question by this religious leader, he's, he's trying to get him to, to stumble on something. This question, and who is my neighbor, is a really loaded question from this, from this Jew because he's got a very different perspective than we do today. All right, so he's asking this, trying to set Jesus up. And Jesus, in, in his brilliant rhetoric way, as, as he always does, he doesn't answer the question directly. He kind of takes the side door to the, to the question, right? He's like, well, I'm not going to just tell you the answer, because how anticlimactic would it have been if Jesus was just like, everyone? And who's my neighbor? And Jesus was like, everyone. That, that, that probably wouldn't have went over very well. The Jew probably would have been like, well, but what about this? What, was it? what about this in the Old Testament? What about the fact that we're God's chosen people? What about all this other stuff? Jesus knew that he was, he was going for the kill here. He knew that he was trying to get him to stumble on something. And he, and he chose this way of telling this parable very, very carefully. So let's look at some of the context of this parable itself. First of all, this road um, that, the, that this person was on, that he got attacked on, it wasn't like he was walking down the perimeter. 
And, and he was just sitting on the side and somebody jumped on him. Like, like you, have to, you have to picture this story. The Roman road system had not yet been extended to Palestine at this, this time. Traveling on foot was actually really dangerous. There was tons of robbers. There was tons of bandits. There was tons of that. But not only that, if, even if there wasn't all of this stuff, this wasn't just like a casual walk around the golf course. Like, this was a massive hike. Get this, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, this road that this guy was walking on, it was particularly brutal to travel. Over the span of about 17 miles, and this is true historic, like, this is geography. This isn't even just, like, me making this up. Over the span of about 17 miles, it, it descends from about a height of 2,500 feet above sea level to about 770 feet below sea level. All right, so this is not just your casual golf course flat plain. This is a hike. This is a, this is a, a brutal terrain. There's no roads to walk down. The, this is not like it's just a casual stroll around the park. The setting that, this, that Jesus is talking about, this guy would have been very uh, familiar with, but this thing went from 2,500 feet above sea level to 770 feet below sea level. First of all, uh, it's kind of weird that there's land below sea level, isn't it? Like, that's like, it's like, you have to really, like, figure out, I'm not a geography expert by any means. That, that was a mind-bending concept for me this week, as simple as it is. So I had to look it up. I had to look it up and see, like, okay, so where's the furthest place below sea level? And does anybody know the answer to that? Yes. The Dead Sea. The furthest place below sea level is actually the Dead Sea. It's about, like, 1,300 feet below sea level. And that's actually only about 30 kilometers away from Jerusalem. Like, this area that we're talking about is one of the—it's it's a vigorous per terrain. Like, Robert would probably love to tell you all about it because he was there, and he, uh, he loves his Israel stuff. So uh, he can probably just—he can back how crazy this road would have been. Um— so that's the setting, that's, the, that's the, the story. It was common. It was common that people would get beat up on this road. It was common that they would get trapped. Um, it wasn't a nice walk in the park. Now let's just look briefly at some of the characters that are in this story, because that's always an important part of stories. Uh, first, we see this priest. We see this priest that walks by and, and, and goes on the other side of the road, on the other side of, of the, the way that he was coming from. He, he directly avoids this person. Now, now, most of you will know who priests are. Priests were the clergy that were responsible for the worship uh, and the sacrifice in the temple system of the day. Um, they, they couldn't necessarily get their hands dirty uh, with something like this, but we'll get back to that in a second. Um, the priest, he avoids him. He just keeps walking on. That's pretty much all that Jesus mentions about him. And then there's this Levite that does the same thing. He does the same thing. This Levite literally walks on the other side of the road or the other side of the pathway as well. Um, but the Levites were, were, they assisted the priests basically. They were um, the guys that, that handled worship or maintaining security um, in the temple. So basically they were youth pastors um, because we're strong and can maintain security and stuff. So if there's ever a fight here, I'll bleed a guy. I'm just kidding. Um, the Levites assisted the priests in their duties, and they, they also had a lot of restrictions on what they could or couldn't do um, if it was time for a ceremony, if they were on their way to do something like that. It's super important to understand that, that the, the law actually prohibited these priests and these Levites from engaging with this unclean person on the street. That's a, that's a really um, important insight to grasp into this, because we can't blame them. Oftentimes, I think in this story, we, we beat the priest and we beat the Levite up. Um, they look like the bad guys. They look like the, the people that really dropped the ball. Um, and the Samaritan looks amazing. And, and, and yes, that's true to a degree. But, but you and I probably would not have done anything different. All right, like it's in our job description to not un, like go near an unclean body if we got to perform a ceremony. Right? Like, like, it wasn't that they were just doing this out of, like, self-pretentiousness. They were doing this out of what the Lord told them to do. All right? So, so let's not beat these guys up a little bit. Um, yes, we want to live like the Samaritan, and we'll get to that. But, but these guys had to remain clean or pure, and a lot of the laws uh, came in direct contact or conflict with them engaging with such diseased or, or possibly down-and-out individuals. Thirdly, the third character we see is the Samaritan. And, and for those of you that don't know, Jews and Samaritans 
aren't necessarily the best of friends. They don't really like each other that much. Um, they have a long lasting hatred for each other, in fact. They, it goes way back to the Old Testament. We don't have time to get into a, a history lesson on, on that this morning. But interestingly, in my reading this week, I found one instance that really highlights their relationship. And it took place in about 6 AD. So this is like really early on. And these, this group of Samaritans, actually it's recorded that they, they, they snuck into the temple at night during Passover. So it's not like this was just during a regular thing. Like this is a pretty big event on, on the Jewish calendar. They snuck into the temple at night during Passover and spread around a bunch of human bones. That's savage. That is literally the definition of savage. As you might tell, they weren't the best of friends. They didn't love each other. They probably weren't hanging out after church or after, after whatever they were doing. The Samaritan that Jesus used, and, and remember that, that, that this teacher of the law that asked the question is a Jewish teacher. He, he probably would have spent a lot of time talking to these Jewish people when he's mentioning this good Samaritan. And, and, and it's really just important to grasp that, that the person that Jesus uses to model their life after, when he's talking about, um, or when he's talking to these people, is a person that they probably don't think very highly of. They kind of think, like, it's like priests, and then Levites, and then everybody else in the temple, and then, like, Gentiles, and then, like, robbers and thieves, and then, like, and then the Samaritans way down at the bottom. That's pretty much the pecking order of the favorite people in the Jews' um, worldview. So you really just have to grasp that, that Jesus is using this person as, as an example of who to live by. And, and this person that he's telling this to probably doesn't like that very much. He probably doesn't, it probably makes him a little bit uncomfortable. Um, yet, we see this example of this person, this, this, this Samaritan being over and above generous. He goes and he helps this guy up. He cleans him up. He stays with him for the day. And then he takes him to this innkeeper and he pays him two denarii. And just a fun fact, two denarii um, probably would have covered about 24 nights at the hotel or the, the inn. Uh, their version of a hotel, um, at the inn in that day. 24 nights. That's a pretty generous thing. Could you imagine uh, taking somebody to a hotel and, and just giving them your MasterCard and being like, yo, this is 24 nights worth. Just throw it on. Just bill me for forever. Help. That's, that's a lot of money. That's, that's a, a pretty significant, generous, above and beyond. So that's the scene. We got this this crazy road, this guy that gets jumped by robbers, this priest, this Levite that passed by, they do nothing. The Samaritan that comes by, loves him, cleans him up, takes care of him. He, he sends him back he take, to the inn. He, he pays for his stay. He even offers to come back after he's got to leave. He's got to leave, he's got to come back. He offers to pay for any extra expenses that the innkeeper might have had. He goes above and beyond with generosity. So the question then is, what, all, what does all this mean? What does all this mean? What does it mean for those who are sitting and listening to Jesus at the time that he might have shared this story? And what does it mean for us as we sit and read this story 2,000-ish years later? See, for the original hearers of the text, especially the Jews, this was revolutionary. This wasn't just like some sort of nice story that made you feel good in church and then you go home and you eat lunch and do this, all this stuff. Like, like this was revolutionary for them. Jesus was, was redefining what this word neighbor was supposed to mean to them. Jesus was redefining who was and wasn't worthy of, of their compassion and their love. And like he's doing over and over and over again is he's bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth this is what the kingdom of heaven looks like when it comes to earth. As he's bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, he's erasing divisions between people groups. Over and over and over again, we see that in scripture. It's no longer about Greek or Jew. It's no longer about male or female. It's no longer about, the list goes on, rich or poor. Jesus, as he brings the kingdom of heaven, is erasing social divisions. As for these religious leaders that pass by on the road, um, they get beat up as we talked about. We assume that they're a bunch of self-righteous jerks, but they're actually probably um, not that bad. It was in their, their job description. But Jesus was also in the process of flipping around some of those job descriptions. 
He was, even in telling this story, he's flipping around the rules and the expectations that, that these Jews were to live by. Jesus says multiple times throughout scripture that I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And this is a story that he doesn't necessarily um, say that in, but it's very clearly highlighted in. He's, not, he's no longer worried about the sacrifice that these priests and everybody has to make at, at the altar and the temple in Jerusalem and all this other stuff. He's worried about people having mercy. He desires mercy, not sacrifice. He's flipping things upside down on everybody especially on these Jews. He's flipping them upside down. One author I read says it so beautifully like this. Just get this. Jesus was a revolutionary in that he advocated an outgoing holiness of healing and bridge building rather than a defensive holiness of withdrawal. See, the priests did what they did. The Levite did what they did on that road, not because they were self-righteous, but because they were trying to remain holy. Because that's what the law had called them to do. I can't blame them for doing that. But, but Jesus, at this point in history, comes in and he's starting to flip those things upside down. Let me read that quote again. Jesus was a revolutionary in that he advocated for an outgoing holiness of healing and bridge building rather than a defensive holiness of withdrawal. He's now saying, no, what it means is to be holy is to go and have mercy not just be defensive when withdrawing from instances like this. So what about for us? What about for us nearly 2,000 years later? Um, how does this story apply to our lives? I mean, it's simple to say, like, yeah, we just need to be good people. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty good summarization. If that's what you li leave here with today, um, then, then you're not doing the worst. But I think it's deeper than that. I think, I think when we take a glimpse into this, into this story, when we take a glimpse into this context, it's actually bigger than that. See, Martin Luther King summarizes this parable um, so beautifully. And he, and he summarizes this shift of perspective, and I hope that you can catch this this morning. Often when we're in a situation like this, our train of thought is, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? That's how we think. That's how we view the world, often. This isn't me beating you up. That's a reality. That's how I think. That's how I, like, like often we, we put ourselves first so frequently. It's, it's a natural human thing. It's part of the broken world that we live in. But often, when we are in a situation like this, our train of thought is if I stop to help this man or this woman or this person or whatever, what will happen to me? And then he says, the kingdom of God doesn't function like that. The question we would need to be asking is if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to them? See, Jesus is flipping everything over in the, in the, the culture, in the eyes of these early Jews that he's talking to, in, in, the, in the perspective of this religious leader that comes up to him and asks him this question that tries to trap him in this. And he doesn't just answer the question by saying everyone. He goes through this elaborate story. And then he says, who are you to then live by or like? And, and who, or who then was the neighbor? And the guy says, well, obviously the Samaritan, you set me up so good, Jesus. Like, how do I, how do I say the priest did this instant? Uh, it's very obvious. But he's flipping it upside down. And it no longer becomes, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? It becomes, if I, stopped, if I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to them? And friends, that's how the kingdom of God works. That's how, how Jesus' ministry works. That's how we need to operate as a church. Not saying we don't already, but that's how we need to do it continually going forward. We need to stop being so worried about what happens to us if we sacrifice something and start being more worried about what will happen to the people around us if we don't sacrifice something. That's what Jesus is getting at here. That's what Jesus is getting at. Even before asking Jesus for a definition of neighbor, this religious leader asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, how can I enter the coming kingdom of God? And Jesus' final recorded words to him are, go and do likewise. You see, eternal life, the revolution of, of God, involves living like the good Samaritan, involves thinking 
less about what will happen to us if we stop to help people and more about what will happen to them if we don't stop to help them. Our worldview changes. Our, our, our view of, of who God is and who his people are and who the world is changes. I imagine that if this story was to be read today, if this story was to be written in today's context, it would sound a little bit like this. On one occasion, this individual who was confident in their theology walked into Pastor Scott's office. Yes, Pastor Scott is Jesus in this story. <laughs> Pastor Scott, they asked, what do you think is the most important thing to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? What does the Bible say about this, he replies. What stands out to you as the most important? They answered, well, Jesus summarizes the commandments by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, it seems like you've got it pretty locked down, he replied. If you do that, you're probably on the right track. I'm trying to like think of like the language that like Pastor Scott would use, like right track. That's got to be a, a Scott Lingo uh, <laughs> lockdown. I was trying to throw out as many of those in there. You're probably on the right track. In reply, Pastor Scott said, a guy was walking down the roughest street in Winnipeg when he got jumped by a gang that ruled that hood. They stripped him of his clothes. They stole his wallet and his phone. They beat him up. They left him hanging there, laughed half dead. And the pastor of the biggest church in Winnipeg happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side because he had to get to this meeting that he was going to. So too, a Catholic bishop also walked by and he had to get to where he was going to, so he passed by on the other side. But, but a Syrian refugee as they traveled by came where the man was and when they saw him, they took pity on him. They went to him and bandaged his wounds and cleaned him up as well as he could. He took him to the hospital and stayed with him the entire time. Then he gave the man his bike. He invited him to stay at his apartment until he could get back on his feet. Which of these men do you think were or was a neighbor and truly lived out their faith? They replied, the one who had mercy on him. And then Pastor Scott said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You can plug in whoever, whatever character you want into this story. I'm not picking on the pastor of the biggest church in the city. I don't even know who that is. Leon Fontaine? I, I don't know. Um, I'm not picking on him or anything. You can plug in whatever. But it's glaringly obvious. It's glaringly obvious which person in this story looks the most like Jesus. It's glaringly obvious which person had mercy on this, per, on, on, this, on this individual that got beat up. In this moment, the people that walked by because they were more worried about what they had to do, where they were going, don't look as much like the love and grace of Jesus as the people, that, as the person that stopped and took the time to love this person. You can plug in whatever, whoever you want into this parable. It's purely allegorical. The reality is if we want to live like Jesus in the world that we live in, if we want to participate in bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, it will, it will result in us not choosing who our neighbor is, not choosing who is worthy of God's grace, not choosing of who is worthy of us taking a little bit of time out of our day to help. We don't get to pick and choose who our neighbor is. We don't get to pick and choose who God's love is for. We don't get to look at the world like the Jews did and say, we're better than everybody else. Here's the next group of people, and here's the Samaritans, and here's the unclean people. We don't get to do that in the kingdom of God. Jesus looks at us, and he, and he sees us all as equals. He looks to our hearts, and he realizes that we are created by him. Whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Syrian refugee, whether you're a hell's angel, whether you're whatever you want to talk about. We don't get to choose who gets the grace of God. We don't get to choose who our neighbor is. 
And friends, if we want to start living like, like Jesus, if we want to start participating in the kingdom of God, can I encourage you? Stop asking what will happen to you if you stop to help somebody or to show somebody love or to show somebody mercy and start asking what will happen to them if you don't. What will happen to them if you don't? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. Thank you for uh, this beautiful group of people. Father, my heart is not that I would stand up here and tell everybody in this place that they're living wrong. That's not how I view it at all. This is a room full of world changers. This is a room full of faithful followers of you, Jesus. And I thank you for that. And I pray this morning that as we get a, just maybe a little bit bigger of a glimpse of your heart, that we would be inspired to go and love like the Good Samaritan loved that we would be inspired to look past any social class, any racial class, any any sexual orientation, division, anything that, that might hinder us from showing somebody who you are, God. May we look through that. And may we start to see the world how you see the world. May we continue to love like you loved Jesus. And may we, every single day, try to become a little bit more like you. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for this this beautiful group of people. And as we go about our time in history, God, may we love people well. May we continue to be grace for everyone and community for everyone and church for everyone. I pray that you'll be with each one of us as we go today. Um, We're excited for Riley to preach next week. God bless him as he prepares this week. Um, And and we just want want to serve you and love you well, Jesus. So thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Go and be love to your neighborhood. We've had church. Now let's go be the church. Amen?